was, that was good. I, I really appreciate that. That's the language of heaven. Now, does Drew usually sit? I can't. I, is that a good look? <laughs> I, I need a stool where my feet can touch the ground. Oh, well. All right, Compass Church, good to meet you. We have, uh, uh, like Truett said, we've done a lot of things together, and you guys were actually meeting at our facility for a while on Thursday nights. Was anybody a, a part of that? Yeah, so that was fun. Um, and uh, we, we love what's going on here. We, we love what you're doing. And, and uh, I really, really uh, love the attitude of a kingdom mentality and not a four walls mentality. You know, this is a, we're in this community together. We're, we're both downtown. As a matter of fact, I, as soon as I'm done here, I've got to go um, sneak back in Foundry and speak over there. Um, I don't think they know I'm missing yet. But, um, <laughs> oh, and by the way, if you, want, if you really like what you hear, come on over. You can hear it twice. Uh, you have that opportunity this morning. I'm sure some of you fathers would really enjoy that. So anyway, um, I, I'm going to be here two weeks. I'm going to be here today and then next week. And so what I thought I would do is... Um, just tell you a little bit about myself this week and, and talk about um, uh, the power of our story. Um, and then next week, what I want to talk about is contentment and the power of being content. And uh, so, so we'll get through those things. But um, yeah, how old are you guys? How many years have you been a church now? 10 years? 10 years? How many have you been here since the beginning? That's awesome. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. And I actually, uh, I have a wife. She's not here today, I don't think. I don't see her. Um, she's also working at Foundry, so if she's here, might both be have to start coming here. But um, <laughs> anyway, or get to start coming here. I'm sorry. Get to start coming here. Um, but my, I have a wife named Joy, and I have three kids. My oldest just graduated from Bend High. He's uh, getting ready to head to the Air Force, actually, so that's exciting. <laughs> And then, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, I actually um, uh, helped him survive that long, and so that's exciting. I, I thought that when, you know, he was getting all these gifts for graduation, you know, I, I was thinking the parents should be getting the gifts for graduation. <laughs> We're the ones that put up with this. I mean, all he did was do what we told him to do, and now he, gra anyhow, I don't know, whatever. But my second oldest is, he is... Uh, going to be a junior at Bend High, and my daughter, who's the youngest and smartest, um, don't tell my boys, they're not here, so I can tell you, but uh, she's going to be a freshman at Bend High, and so that's who we are. But um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, myself, and then we'll, we'll, we'll throw some Bible stuff up here in just a few minutes um, and talk about that. But I was born in West Virginia, born and raised in West Virginia, and I grew up in a very fundamentalist church. Anybody here grow up in a fundamentalist church? All right. So somebody will get my jargon. All right. And if you're at Compass, I'm assuming you're not that anymore. I don't know. I've met Drew. I don't know what he does, but he doesn't strike me as the fundamentalist type. I don't know, though. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm assuming on him. Um, but I grew up in a church, and uh, it was called an independent fundamental Baptist church. Anybody familiar? Nobody? Yeah, that sounds pretty scary, right? Uh, but it was an independent fundamental Baptist church, and we, were, we called ourselves very proudly independent, fundamental, soul-winning, Bible-believing, militant, <laughs> King James-only Baptist church. How many, anybody know what King James-only is? You guys are just, you're going to just have a blast this morning, I think. I don't know. Uh, happy Father's Day. Um, so... King James only is, there's a version of the Bible called the King James Version. And uh, there's nothing wrong with liking the King James Version. It's very hard to read, I think. But um, we grew up and we said that was the only version that was a legit version. That everything else was, we called it a perversion. And uh, so, anyway, yeah. And so, um, we grew up in that situation. And the, the women had, it was a very, very hard uh, situation on the women that attended the church. They had to dress a certain way. They, they had to wear uh, either culottes. How many know what culottes are? You ever heard of Man, you guys are with it today. I like it. All right, way to go. All right, so 
You, you guys are familiar with the ways of the South. All right, so they had, a, we had, to, they had to wear culottes below their knee or a skirt below their knee, and generally much further down. And we only sung hymns out of a hymn book. This was Satan's tool here. And uh, uh, no drums, no anything. It had to be piano or organ because that's the way it's going to be in heaven. You didn't know heaven was going to be that boring, did you? Um, <laughs> So uh, we had that, and, and long story short, it was just a very, very strict fundamental. So we would go out and do what we call soul winning. I mean, you've heard of soul winning before. And soul winning is when you go out and you, what, what we called it, what we did is we would go knock on doors, and you'd knock on a door and someone would answer the door, and we'd say, hey, I like your car out front. That's a really nice car. Where'd you get it? Blah, 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 Whatever we did to talk. And then we would say, hey, before I go, I, I, we would invite him to church. And we'd say, hey, before I go, let me ask you this question. And sure. And, or could I ask you a question? Are you 100% sure that if you die today, you go to heaven? And if they said anything other than 100%, then we had a sales pitch that we would bring him and try to get him to say a prayer. And if we got him to say a prayer, then we considered them a convert. And that's what we did. And we would wear a suit and tie. Men had to wear suits and ties everywhere. At any rate, it was a very strict fundamentalist background. That's how I grew up. And then I went to college. And I went to, the, to a independent, fundamental, militant, soul winning, King James only <laughs> college. And, and that's, that's my education. I, I don't know if Truett knew that, but I really don't have much of an education. I had a really good indoctrination, but not much of an education. And so... Um, I uh, went to this college, and I met my wife, who also grew up in independent, fundamental, militant, soul winning. And, and, and she came from an even stricter sect of this thing. And, and so we met there, and we fell in love, and, and we weren't allowed to have any physical contact at our college. I mean, we were only 21 and 22. Um, we weren't incapable of making decisions on our own at that point in time, apparently. And so we weren't allowed to hold hands, touch shoulders, touch the same hymn book at the same time, anything of the sort. That was called indirect contact, by the way, in case you know. So at any rate, I, we grew up there. We met. We fell in love. We got married about a year later, and we went back to West Virginia. She was from Pasco, Washington, actually. How I many familiar with Tri-Cities? Yeah, so she was from Pasco, Washington. We met in Tennessee at college. I'm skipping a lot here. I'm sorry, but I got I got to get somewhere. Um, and then um, we went to West Virginia as, as a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor, and she was my wife. And um, and so we did that, and it was terrible, horrible experience. Maybe one day I'll tell you about that. Maybe next week. That's a fun story too. And uh, so, or a fun story. You may not think this was a fun story. I don't know. But anyway. Um, so we went back there after 14 months, we had just had enough, which is pretty typical for any youth pastor, quite honestly. And, um, uh, we decided to, I decided to move out West cause my wife was from Pasco. We were going to move in with my in-laws and I just needed to get my head clear and try to figure things out. So we, we packed up, my wife was six months, this is such a West Virginia story. My wife was six months pregnant and, uh, possibly barefoot. I don't remember. And, um, uh, <laughs> We, we loaded up the car and moved to Beverly, you know, we, we, we took off. How many of you got that reference? Anybody? All right. You, you guys are way more with it than I thought. I, I was worried about this. So we packed up the car and we headed out west and we moved out west and we got here and I tried to find a bunch of different jobs and tried to do, but, but I couldn't find anything solid. I couldn't find anything that was more than temporary. And so through a process, we decided to start an independent fundamental Baptist church in a little town called Hermiston, Oregon. You guys know Hermiston? What was that about? How did you guys know even about it? Yeah, of course, watermelons, but that's all. I mean, so anybody here from there? Kind of? How? Yeah, you're very familiar with it. I, I get. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyway, we went to Hermiston and we decided we were going to start this church. And here was our reasoning. Now, just so you can get an idea, our reasoning was there was no other independent Baptist church there, independent fundamental Baptist church there. So, so we were going to go start the one true church in Hermiston, Oregon. Yeah. And so we went and we started a church, and we started off with 39 people on grand opening Sunday. I remember that. 
So my wife and I started a church in, in October 8th of 2000. I, and I have a coffee mug. That's how I remember. Um, but October 8th of 2000, we started Victory Baptist Church. That, that's a fundamentalist name, isn't it? Victory Baptist Church. And we started that church. And uh, we had 39 people to start. And God used that time, that whole process, what God was doing was getting me to where I was, we were isolated from everything else and we had to actually start thinking for ourselves. And so we were in the midst of this and we were trying to start this church and it was obviously floundering and it was just hard to, to I mean, nobody out West cares about, at least it, I, we were finding that there were very few people that were um, used to church. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a southern sense, I guess, in a, in a West Virginia sense. And, and so it was, it was very hard to get people to come to church. And, and then what it was hard to do was get people to dress like we wanted them to dress. <laughs> that, was, that was really hard. I, excuse me, ma'am. I'm glad you're here today. But my wife would like to talk to you about those jeans you're wearing. For some reason, that didn't go over super well. You know? Ran a lot of people off, you know? And so we were in the middle of this thing and starting this church, and it was just, um, is that clock right? Is it 10 o'clock? Man, i got to hurry up. Church starts in 15 minutes. All right, so <laughs> here we go. Now, I, I, we, we started a church, and, and I, I called a friend who was in, the, in, in my wedding, he was a friend of mine. And I was in his wedding. He's in my wedding. I called him because 911 had happened. 911 had happened. And I knew he was in the New York area, New York, New Jersey area. And I called him. Now, understand we are in this mindset. When you grow up in a mindset like that, there's no other, you can't see outside of it. And you, when you look at people that are in a certain mindset, in a certain way like that, oftentimes we'll look at people like that and we'll be like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? But the truth is, when you're in the middle of it, and that's all you know, and that's your culture, and that's your life, you can't see outside of it. And so, all that being said, I call my buddy, and we're talking about, and he ends up, he, he's nowhere near New York City, but he's in New Jersey somewhere. But anyway, we end up talking, and he asked me a question that changed my life. And this is the, the silliest question that's probably ever changed somebody's life. He said this, he said, are you still King James only? And I said, of course I'm still King James only. I'm a Christian, right? I mean, that's how that works, right? I said, of course I'm still King James only, which was the version we were talking about. And I said, you are, I, I, I said, you are too, right? And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, I was about to hang up on him. I literally almost hung up on him. And I, I said something that changed my life forever, changed the entire trajectory of my life. I said, why? Why? And he went on to explain to me, and that one question knocked a little corner off of my house of cards that I had built up in this religious system that I was all about. You see, I knew all about Jesus. I knew all about the Bible. I knew all about how to cross my T's, dot my I's, how to look like church, how to dress. I had, I had double-breasted suits. I had the regular suits. I had three-button suits. I had pocket squares. I had nice ties. I had the whole nine yards polished shoes, everything. I knew how to play the game where I came from, and I knew all that. I knew how to be a good, independent, fundamental Baptist kid and, and man and, and husband and all of that, but I didn't know the grace and the goodness of God until that moment. And when I asked why, something happened. Something happened. It made me realize, oh, oh man, that wasn't I, that, that is something that wasn't true. And so I said, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? And through that, God started this incredible transition, at least in my life. To me, it was incredible. This transition to take me away from legalism and, and, and this rigid fundamentalism and take me towards a life of grace and truth and love and goodness and mercy. And, and it's been a, an amazing journey ever since. As we, as, we, as we started on that trek, that was 2001. About 2006, I had managed to grow that church from about 40 to about six. <laughs> it was an amazing cycle. 
It was a beautiful thing. So I remember one day I came in and I had tried to pastor everybody through where I was going, but I just, I, I just couldn't. Everybody had their breaking point because the whole church was independent, fundamental Baptist. And when you got to a certain point, everybody had their breaking point and they had to go because they loved what they were in. And so after, one day I came in and I looked and there were six people in the church. Six it's like, I didn't even take it. I was like, eh, don't worry about the offering. I know all of you. This is not going to go well. So, um, <laughs> the, so I sat there and I had one of those moments with God where I was like, look, I'm done. I'm out. I don't know what to do. And about that time, I got a job offer. This is about 06. I got a job offer from, from a, a, a fundamental church up in the Tri-Cities that supposedly was going in a little different direction, but they wanted me to come. And I remember the pastor sat down with me and he said, look, a couple things I can offer you are this. I can get you out of poverty. <laughs> it's like, mm, that's, a, that's a tempting. That's really tempting. <laughs> and and we, can pay you a we can pay you a living wage. And I was like, man, that's what kind of wage? I've never heard of that before, a living wage? And so it was really tempting but it would have been a step back toward where I was coming from. And so my wife and I were getting ready to go and we had taught, had a couple interviews and we were getting ready to go up on a Sunday night and we were getting ready to, I was gonna speak in front of the church that night and they were gonna vote on me. And I was putting on my tie and I hadn't worn a tie since about 02. And I was putting on my tie and I buttoned that top button and it was like, you know, I just strangle, strangle. And I was putting on that tie and I had my collar popped up and I looked at Joy and I was like, I hate this. I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And she goes, oh, thank God. I didn't want you to do it either. I just didn't know what to say. The money was tempting, but I, I just, the, the thought. And, and so I called the guy right then. This is like two hours before I was supposed to speak. And I was like, we don't want the job. And he's like, what do you mean you don't want the job? And I was like, I told you as soon as I knew, I'd let you know, and we don't want the job. And he got angry, and he hung up the phone, and it was the last I ever talked to him, which is probably a pretty good sign that I shouldn't have been there anyway. But as we got off the phone, that was about two weeks before Easter of 06. I come in Easter Sunday, all excited. Hopefully, we'll get into double digits. You know, it's Easter. We're excited about that. <laughs> and... We were in this ratty little old church building that we had renovated-ish, and um, I come in, and it was, there was probably 20 people there, and there's this one couple that came in, and he had really long hair in a ponytail, and his wife was just in jeans and flip-flops and chill, and we did our thing for Easter, and we went to talk to him afterwards, and they were the opposite of independent fundamentalists. They were the opposite of that. But we had gotten rid of all of that. And when they came, long story short, they said, hey, we, would, we love what you're doing. We love uh, where we're at. We love the small setting. We'd love to be a part. Uh, we can sing. We can do some different things. We'd love to just maybe help you grow this thing, help, help you see it, whatever God wants to do. And they stuck around, and that was the, that was the bottom. And we started to come back up the other side. And, and, and we got to about uh, 110, 120 people. And then that's when Foundry called. And we had bought a new building. And we had got everything good. And we had remodeled this thing. And, and, and long story short, God, through his, his wisdom and his mercy and his grace, brought me out of fundamentalism, brought me out of legalism, and brought me toward grace. And he's still working on me. But... but he brought me, and he brought me from Hermiston to Bend, which was exciting too. And I'll tell you that story next week as we're talking about contentment. And I say all that to say this. I, I think I have a boring story. And some of you probably do too right now. <laughs> I think I have a boring story. Now, back in Joshua's day, back in Joshua's day, the Israelites, Moses had just died. I don't know, most of you probably know these stories. Moses had just died, who had led the Israelites out of Egypt. And after Moses died, a guy named Joshua took over for him. And Joshua was getting ready to lead the people across the Jordan River into the Promised Land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. This is a crazy story. It's worth reading. And I'm not going to give it all to you. Um, but they were right at the edge of the Jordan River. 
And God told Joshua, he said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant and I want you to take, have the priests carry it about 200 yards in front of everybody. And I want them, when they come up, I want them to step down in the water. And when they step down in the water, the water is going to back up from where they're standing. And I want them to walk in the middle of the water, which is the Jordan River, and it was at flood stage. The water is going to dry up and I want everybody to walk past the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says that the entire nation walked across that water as the priest stepped down into it. It backed up for miles and miles and miles all the way back to a city called Adam, which was several miles back. And, and the water backed up and the water flowed on down and the, wa the ground dried up and they walked out a miraculous crossing. They walked out into the middle and stood there with the Ark of the Covenant, which was this little three foot by three foot gold glimmering box with two cherubim on the top. You guys have saw Indiana Jones, right? You know what it looks like. And uh, so they, they walked out there in the middle and they stood and, and all, uh, they say about a million people walked past them on dry ground and walked to the other side. Now that's a cool story. Now, here's the thing about that story. In the middle of that story, God comes to Joshua and he says, I want you to do something. I want you to take one man from each tribe. How many tribes were there? Awesome. Man, you guys are, you go over to Foundry and help me out this morning, all right? So anyway, uh, actually, I'm preaching a different message. They've heard this one. Um, so they, they, he's had one from each tribe pick up a stone from the middle of the Jordan. And he said, carry it with you. We're going up to Gilead. That's where we're going to camp. So carry it with you. So each one of them carried a stone on their shoulder. So they brought 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan where they were crossing. Now he did something curious in the middle of that too. He also set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan behind where the ark was. And he set those stones up as a memorial. But what happened to those stones? As soon as the people walked across, the ark went across and then what happened? The water came back across so what happened to those 12 stones that Joshua set up? They went underwater, right? So that, that I think when we think about our story, there's, there's power in our story. Each one of us is walking a unique life. You're walking a unique journey. All of, some of you, how many of you just uplift your hand and say, my story is pretty boring? Anybody? Anybody? How many of you say, my story is great? Anybody? Good, good. There's, there's, there's a mix. But all of us are walking different journeys. How many of you, when you grew up, how you grew up in Bend, Oregon? Wow, like six of you. That's a record. That's amazing. Uh, bunch of Californians probably, I'm guessing. But anyway, <laughs> you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. <laughs> so, that's the first thing when someone comes in and they're from California, I'm like, change your license plate ASAP. That's the first thing you need to do. So... My wife will just flip you off. It's bad. But anyway, um, I'm just kidding. I didn't grow up here. But how many of you that grew up in Bend or California thought you would ever be at a Father's Day service where an Arkansas guy was leading worship and a West Virginian was talking to you? That's pretty unique. All of us are on a unique journey. But here's the thing. The most powerful thing that we have is our story. Because it's yours. It's uniquely yours. And you might think it's boring. I think mine's kind of boring. But the truth is there's somebody out there that needs to hear your story. They need to hear what you're going through. Your kids need to hear how Jesus is working in your life. Your grandkids, all your grandkids, tons of them, need to hear what God is doing in your life. They need to hear how Jesus is working. They need to see how Jesus has molded and shaped you into the man or the woman or the person that you are today because we need to memorialize what Jesus is doing on our unique path. Now, if we jump ahead here, if we jump and look in Joshua chapter 4, one slide over, it says this, On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. Now they had the twelve that were in the middle of the water that were already underwater, but he took the twelve that God had told him, and he took them and he set them up. Now here's the thing. The twelve that went underwater are just good memories for the people there. 
right? Everybody that was there would remember that those 12 stones were under there. They would remember that amazing story of God working in their lives. But we need something else. We need to tell our story. We need to tell the story of God working in us. We need to tell the story of God's grace and God's goodness in our lives. We need to tell the story of God bringing us from darkness to light. We need to tell the story of God bringing us out of bondage and into freedom. We need to tell that story to the next generation so that they can know that God is real and he works and he's good and he loves and he's working in their lives for their unique journey as well. So check out what they did. One more. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Let's go one more. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. And one more. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Why did they set up those stones? Why did they put something there that they could look at? So when the kids would come and they'd say, what's this about? They could tell the story of God's goodness and God's grace and God's power. Man, we should set up some, we, as Christ's followers, we should have things set up. in the situation. I'm not talking about idols. I'm talking about stories. I'm talking about sitting our kids down. I'm talking about whatever it is. And when our kids ask us, well, how did you grow up? What did you do? What do you do? Here's what happened. Here's what God's doing in my life. My story's boring. I came from a boring church and started another boring church. And then uh, it got to be a slightly more exciting church. And then I ended up in Bend. And then my kids are like, yeah, whatever. But you know what? There'll come a day when they'll look back at that story and they'll be like, wow, God is pretty good. God is pretty good. That is pretty amazing. And you know what? My story might be boring to a lot of people, but there are some people that my story can help. There are people that are stuck in fundamentalism and legalism all over this world, some even in our own city, that are stuck in this, this trap of performance-based Christianity, which brings nothing but conditional love and heartache and difficulty and loss of relationship and everything else. It's hard. It's a difficult life. But you know what? Stories like mine might be boring to a lot of people, but to some people stuck in those situations, my story can be one of hope and of goodness and of grace. We need to tell the story of who we are and the journey we're on because God is working in your life uniquely and there's somebody he's bringing in your life that needs your story. There's power in who God has made you to be. Amen? Dear only Father God, we just...